Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome to, to the 11 o'clock session. I, um, I, I'm going to confess something. I was deeply touched by that last session, as I'm sure many others were. In fact, I can, I can account for that because there was a pool of water in the bathroom when I went there and several people kind of mopping up their tears. Um, so deeply affected by that. And as a result of that, I'm going to come out to you a lot as the audience to participate in this session. I hope that's all right with you. So, um, yeah, expect me to descend upon you and ask you questions. I'm Claire Priestley. I'm Director of IT at City, University of London. I'm also going to shamelessly plug CIO Plus One, which I'm founder of. That's an initiative to improve diversity, specifically in tech leadership, or representation, as I'm starting to rebrand it. Um, I think it's important that we are representative rather than necessarily diverse. Um, so today's session is uh, around about, it, it's about getting the right people on board. It's about attracting and retaining and developing the right talent. And if we listen to McKinsey, they reckon that an organization uh, recruiting talented individuals is eight times, eight times more successful um, as a result of that. They also believe that over a third of senior leaders make getting the right talent the top of their list in terms of issues that they're facing at the moment. So we've got an amazing panel of people today. Jim Nottingham from University of the Arts in London. We've got Hil Hilary Baker, who some of you heard from this morning talking about diversity, equity, as I know you call it, uh, and inclusion. Uh, Hilary's from the California State University. And we've also been joined by Natasha Say Salem. That's a really difficult name to, to, to pronounce. Uh, who's joining us from, from the commercial sector, from Sky. So I'd like to kick off, if I may, uh, just by getting a, a sense of each of your perspectives in terms of talent and why you've got a particular uh, desire to talk about it here today. Can I start with you, Natasha? Sure. I've, I've heard you talked about or referred to as the human skills lady. Right, yes. What, what's that all about? So I'm going to talk about it in my session this afternoon. So plug, come and check out my session. It's going to be great. Um, so it's rebranding soft skills. I don't like the word soft skills. I think they're anything but soft. Um, and actually, they, calling them soft gives them a disservice. I think that the better term for them are human skills, or actually to really call them what they are, critical business skills. Um, and I think that in technology, we focus a lot on hard skills, we focus a lot on coding, on the data science, but tangible skills. Um, and we are in a situation where there are more jobs than people, and I can get why we would do that, but we can't ignore the human skills. Mm. Um, and nearly all of the times projects fail, nearly all of the times companies fail, it's not because of people not being the cleverest people in the room, it's not because they don't have the smartest coders, it's a lack of human skills. Mm. Um, so for me, a huge amount is looking at the value of human skills and allowing people to cross-train into tech mm. um, with transferable skills. Mm. And I know, Hilary, that's something that you're particularly keen on in, in, in the California State University, is looking at students and looking at how to develop that pipeline using the student community as, as well as others. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, good, good morning. Um, uh, this still morning. Um, uh, yes, student... Hiring students is a wonderful, wonderful way for us to bring able to just bring diversity into our IT organizations. Um, I've done a, we've done a lot of, of reaching out to students, not only in areas where you would expect us to reach out to, um, computer science, information systems. We've also reached out a lot to um, information security that happens to be in business. We do a lot of work with um, marketing and branding of our IT projects to get the, the knowledge out there across the campus. And so we're working with our cinnamon and television arts um, groups. But, but so it, really across the campus, how can, we, how can we have students work with us? How do we, um, we, we do a lot to try and include them as employees, treat them as, a, as though they're, 
they're really full-time employees, although they're not, so they participate in all of our um, social events that we have, morale building groups, we have a, a student award competition for st students that work with us in IT um, that we, we fund and support every year. Um, they're part of our summer picnic program. I mean, we just, we, we're trying to do all we can to encourage them when they're with us. And in, as they become graduating seniors, we do all we can to identify those that we might want to hire and work with them early in that graduating senior year so that we are viewed as a viable employer as opposed to just um, having them go out and, and desperately try and find another job as they're graduating. We want to be seen as one of those viable employers too. That's great, thank you, Hilary. And Jim, we talked also about waging a war on the term soft skills, and I yes. know you feel particularly pas passionate about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean I'm very similar <laughs> to Patrick. You know, I, it's one of those terms I abhor. You know, I, I don't like that term. I think it sends out completely the wrong connotations about what we actually need in the sector, you know, where we're going with process change, process improvement, process improvement engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and it, it, by calling it something other than it really is, you know, key business skills, I, I think you're, you're belittling it and you're, and you're continuing a sort of patriarchal view of the world in, in those terms. So, so I'm very uh, aware that, that quite often we put in our job descriptions those types of things or, or we don't actually check our, our job descriptions very carefully. I mean, there are now bot type systems that will check them for you uh, for, for unconscious bias and, and using the right terminology and the right languages if you are stuck for that sort of thing. But, but I think it's very important that you, you sort of approach that recruitment piece in a, very, in a fairly bland way, in a very neutral way. Uh, we don't look for things, I, I, I also, you know, unless it's a highly technical role that requires certain qualifications, I won't say because you're going to come and work in my IT department, I, you, you should have a, you know, a computer science degree. You know, you know, that's, you know, that's old times, that's, that's old times. You know, I actually want people who are creative, who are flexible, who understand agility, who are very bright, who, 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 who have a real commitment to professionalism. Uh, the technical stuff can come later, but, but it's actually getting, getting those people on board who, who are really in that space. I think that's much more value to an organization than just sort of going to through the, through the um, you know, we're, we're sort of victims to the various job, uh, job hero evaluations mm -hmm. and hey and hero and all those ones. And I, and I think that's at a university level or a governance level, that's where we need to push back as leaders. We need to push back on those and say, actually, it's completely inappropriate that we have those types of words in those types of descriptions using those types of evaluation procedures for particular roles. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a really key point. That's a great point, really refreshing to hear. Is that, is that borne out in the private sector also? Do we, do we see a, a shift in terms of the um, characteristics, capabilities that we're looking for because of a, a new breed of role? Data science is coming in, digital user experience. Has that, has that manifested in the same way in the, in the private sector? Absolutely. Um, but I think it's pragmatism, I think also, I cannot stress the point enough of there are more jobs than people in our sector. So we have to be much more creative about how we address um, talent in the sector. So, um, but also a lot of the roles that we advertise, they're not obvious roles. You know, Scrum Master doesn't really give many people clues to what it is, unless you know what a unless Scrum Master do, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, you know, it, it has very bizarre connotations if you don't know what it is. Um, and I think that a lot of it is demystifying what these roles are. If you stopped Joe Bloggs in the street right now and said, look, name me 10 jobs in the music industry, they'd be able to do it. They'd be able to say publisher, musicians, tour manager, roadie, choreographer, publisher, um, you know, but then say, right, name 10 roles in IT. Mm. And they would say web developer, possibly a Steve Jobs character, possibly mm. a designer. And that's the harsh reality of our industry is that we have a role to play to demystifying what those roles are because you will not get more people transferring into those roles with great transferable skills from other sectors unless they know those roles exist. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, the reason I do these things is to help um, bridge the gap between, um, you know, industry and with academia. But um, we all have a role to play in, in, in creating a spotlight on those. So we do a lot of events, we um, do a lot of blogging uh, to help educate people to not only what these roles are, but how their existing skills from other sectors could be easily transferred into those roles. Mm. And is that something that you see over in, in the States also, a de demystifying of, of 
what we know to be tech roles? A absolutely. Not only demystifying for future um, people that we're hiring, but we're also going through a whole lot of reclassification of our staff roles that have traditionally been here. So we don't hire programmers. Um, we maybe hire developers, but more more likely architects now. Mm -hmm. um, the whole cloud, whole movement to hybrid and cloud has changed the terminology around those positions. Um, we're also trying to, to really bring up a new generation, not just have managers and staff, but really, really have the pathway of, of what, what does a lead mean or, or other terms along the way. So, so really trying to, trying to change the terminology, um, in, but also in ways, as you suggested, Natasha, that, that people can understand reading them. I mean, most of our job postings, our position descriptions are so convoluted. They're just so hard to understand. And yet the jobs are really exciting if I, people could really understand what they are. Yeah. Exactly. And I think you make a really valid point that I just thought, of, which is we also don't have consistency in our job titles. You know, we, I talked about Scrum Master in another company. It might be an agile coach. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got tester, quality assurance. I hate that term. Um, but manual testers, developer and test. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we don't use the same, you know, software developer, programmer. And I think that we, we almost speak our own language. Um, and that fluency of being in the sector, we understand it, but it's really difficult coming into the mm. sector and kind of, I do get asked, what's the difference between a programmer and a developer? Mm -hmm. And it's like, there isn't any, mm -hmm. but, you know. So, so Jim, mm. given what you said about pushing back on policies and, yes. and procedures mm. and some of, the, some of the specific HE sector challenges that we mm. face, uh, is it also time for a rebrand of IT, do you think? Could we call it something else? Yeah, we, we were vaguely talking about this, uh, and, and I, I think there is, you know, you, you, in, in some universities, you will end up being the technical side, you know, you know, if you're not careful, you'll be leading a team of, of people who are largely, you know, fixing the network, doing a bit of Wi-Fi, and maybe, uh, you know, facilitating some student record systems, and I think the, the role of IT, the role of, of IT services has completely changed. Uh, you know, at my institution, we've our staffing has increased by nearly 60%, but that area of 60% increase in staffing is projects and programs, and they complement each other. Uh, and, and the universities are beginning strategically to take that on board, to understand that they cannot be in that digital space unless they're making these, these very significant changes to their structures. And, and, and in doing so, you then end up in the, in the quandary of, of how do you recruit you know, qualified people when you're expanding into those areas? You know, you, it's, it's an extremely difficult area. And, uh, you know, uh, Claire and I from, from London, it's, it's highly competitive. And it does mean that you do have to, say you know, politely, we have to bend the rules a little bit. You know, we have to, you have to challenge uh, where your HR department thinks you should be doing what they think you should be doing you need to put yourself at that level and say actually why have we got a policy of, of if you've got a care you know caregiving responsibilities we've got a policy that you can't actually take that caregiving responsibilities option until you pass probation that's ridiculous you know you know, you know so they're, and they're you know you just keep hammering away at it and you say Look, i'm just not going to do that policy you do what you like you know, you know we we cannot work that way because we cannot get qualified candidates through the door if they cannot continue with their their caring responsibilities whatever responsibilities they've had outside of work at the same time when they're starting a new role you know that's that's just the sector mm. as, as someone said about brexit i'm gonna say again you know you're kneecapping yourself you know <laughs> it's kind of that way but and I, I, un I understand that it's even more heavily unionized in, in your area. Well, yes, not all. Um, uh, obviously, not all American universities are unionized, but California State University is. And, um, and I don't see that as uh, a total negative. No. It's, it's certainly an opportunity, and there's, there's wonderful clarity and equity that comes with many of the benefits with that. Um, and... There are also um, struggles when you try and make some of these moves. So this whole IT classification that we're going through across the whole of the CSU, not just my institution, so that's, um, that's 23 institutions across the state. I mean, it's, it's a big deal. This will probably be in place for the next 20 years. So it matters that we do it right and that we don't just do it for right now, that we're really doing it for, for jobs that we don't even know exist. Because of course, how many jobs do we have now working for us that didn't exist five years ago? Mm -hmm. So how are we, how are we addressing that? 
what skill uh, jobs that we don't know exist yet? Yeah, the digital skill shortage that was referred to yesterday by both Nick and, and Sally, and and those unknowns, you know, the old mm. Rumsfeld theory. I think it's a really tricky one. I mean, we were talking about it earlier. I'm of a generation where we didn't have computer science at my school. I promise I didn't go to a, a business school, but um, and many of the women that I speak to who want to get into the industry are in that back in a sort of bucket of you know seeing the technology industry passing by them seeing all these great opportunities and feeling like it's passed by them um, as an, an employer of sky what we do is we offer um, ways to get into the industry so picking up on the, the diversity angle we offer an absolutely free three month coding course called get into tech um, it's aimed at women of all ages. Um, it's part-time, weekends, or full-time. I think there's different options based on your, your circumstances. Is that just for employees of Sky? No, it's, it's aimed at everyone. External. Free for anybody? Absolutely free, and it's in Le uh, Livingston, Leeds, and London. Amazing. Um, and absolutely free. Over 160 women have done that, and about 50 of those women now work at Sky in technology. Brilliant. Um, and I think that one of the key things is giving people access to these trainings and as universities you're, you're set up for this sort of thing and I think one of the key things I would say is that we want more people into the industry we want more diversity into the industry rather than banging our fists on the table and saying we want it how can we make it mm -hmm. um, and I think that's it's been such a great success story for us. We also run uh, Women in Tech Scholars, where we offer five women the opportunity to come uh, pitch their ideas to us. Mm -hmm. um, and if there are, we think it's an idea that we, we think you know, will do good, um, we give a £25,000 bursary, uh, along with access to mentors and training um, for a year to bring their idea to fruition. Um, and again, these are a mixture of ages. Um, it's open to all women. Uh, we also do a lot of external events, master classes, um, to give back to the community and mm. to obviously invest in the community. Mm. To answer your question about what is out there and what we um, need, I think when you work in technology, you have to get used to the fact that you are constantly learning, that you are constantly retraining. Uh, you know, I started out coding in Flash, and obviously that's an incredibly useful skill nowadays. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I had Netscape Navigator, and, um, you know, <laughs> as some, uh, one of my uh, friend's nieces told me, you know, I showed her a floppy disk, and she asked me why I, I had a, a 3D printout of the save icon. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Brilliant. Huh? Uh, but, you know, the quicker you get comfortable with the fact that you are constantly learning, uh, mm -hmm. then the more successful you'll be in the technology industry. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's the way I would answer it, is that you look at trends and be comfortable that you'll have to relearn. Mm -hmm. And what about gener generational diversity? What are we doing specifically to, um, to target millennials, to, to prepare ourselves for alternative demands in terms of the way that we work, the culture at work? Mm -hmm. I, I think we're, we're, we're beginning, I'm beginning to see that, 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 that I think the, the, the younger workforce is far more mobile uh, and there's an expectation that they will work any time, any place, anywhere. And, and the, uh, the, the, the rather rigid of if we're still expecting staff to turn up at nine and go home at five, you know, that's not going to work. That's not where we're going to be, I think, in 10 years time. I think it's going to be far more uh, you know, flexibility, uh, how you coordinate all that, how you, uh, and I don't yeah. know if you're interested in someone like yeah. Sky does, because I'm sure they employ lots of uh, freelancing and that yep. sort of stuff, and I think freelancing will be a much bigger thing. But in universities, we tend to be quite structured, and I think we need to let go of those structures. So does it really matter if someone's fixing some really difficult mm -hmm. code in, in, in the student record system at, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the morning? You know, and I think, I think there's, a slight, there's going to be a slight cultural change in, in the way we approach that. I don't know. I think there has to be, because yeah. we're, we're competing with, with Sky and, <laughs> and others um, for these jobs mm. and the flexibility that our young professionals are expecting to have in their job. I mean, it's an absolute given. Mm. And that means flexibility of hours, of time, of, of what their job space looks like. You know, the whole bring your dog to work is, is <laughs> you know, we, we understand that that's what we're competing with. Mm. Um, 
where you know in a union shop i can't even put, i can't even pay for coffee unless i buy it mm. so we can't even offer those sorts of things as service and then we're competing with corporations that are buying meals three times a day mm. um very very different place i i am I'm, I'm thrilled to hear what sky's doing in in those programs and i have to say that i'm proud of the industry that we're in um, in, in that many of the corporations are now offering um, services to try and, and really allow our students and future staff to, to really learn some skills. We've, um, we're, we're just in the midst of our um, annual jam competition, a student competition, um, and it's an AI jam competition this year. And we've had um, three of our major vendors, um, um, Microsoft and AWS and, um, and someone else, that, uh, Google, um, who offered to come in and, and basically be able to, to train any students that wanted to learn how to use some of the skills. Obviously, some of the students know that, some didn't. But, but the, the resources that are out there, there are, there are lots of them. And, and we need to be preparing many of those together mm -hmm. um, and offering those as ongoing skill development for our staff that are, that are right here too. And it suggests there's a real opportunity for universities in particular to work with some of those bigger organisations. Somebody mentioned earlier in the diversity session the work that Rachel Hyam and BT are doing. I'm, I'm not sure who that was, but um, you know, we, we've got any number of examples of very large organisations throwing initiatives like this at us. What are we doing? Are we working in partnership with, with big players like that as a sector? I don't think not in this space. Mm -hmm. you know, we're definitely working with the big players, but, but, but it, it's not, you know, we're working more on the technology basis. You know, As opposed uh, to yeah, talent. Yeah, quid pro quo sort of uh, arrangements, but we're not, we're not approaching this. And I think it's a really interesting point that, that we have these very large suppliers, we all work with them, Microsoft, et cetera. And one of the speakers this morning talked about Oracle and uh, how they weren't that clear about their diversity policies, et cetera. And it's one of the reasons they, they, they didn't do so well in a contract negotiation because they just simply weren't able to, to, to place that. It, it, and, and actually nowadays, you know, that I would certainly expect to see that. That's just part of the scoring mechanism for mm -hmm. when you're procuring. You know, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? Do you mm -hmm. have that? Great, great, great. You know, uh, and I think that's part of it. But I think we haven't really explored that working uh, you know, at, at that level in terms of the in terms of pipeline, in terms of technology. You know, that's a really interesting point. So what else can we practically do in terms of the development of that pipeline and um, given some of the constraints that we work in within mm. the se work within within the sector what, what are the practical steps would you say as, a, as an outsider looking into this mm. particular sector points i'd like to make tell uh, us what to uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah give us the answer um so number one i would say you most of universities have industry advisory boards right you kind of have groups of if not set one up um mm have an advisory board of people outside of academia, possibly alumni, possibly influencers in, you know, in a really good mix. So not just lots of big players, but mm. maybe more smaller innovative startups yeah. um, and get them, you know, invite them in to be an industry steering board for your, mm. for your faculty, for, you know, for your department, because they will help, you know, I'm on the industry steering board for the University Leeds School of Computing and I can go in and wax lyrical about, you know, how they, you know, need to be teaching their students a bit more about JavaScript because as an industry, as a sector, it's all about JavaScript now for us. Mm -hmm. um, agile and collaborative working, you know, when we get graduates, they tend to want to work by themselves and, mm -hmm. and that's maybe a symptom of how they have been taught. So when they come into somewhere like Sky and they're straight into a squad and they have to work collaboratively, those human skills come back into play mm -hmm. and it, it takes yeah. us a long time yeah. to, to kind of train out things that they've potentially been taught mm -hmm. um, and that they've got to think about collaboration. They can't just be a lone, lone wolf and do lots of commits at midnight and break a code base and, mm -hmm. and it, it just is a, it's a huge amount of teamwork. And so... Those are the sorts of things that I talk about in the industry steering board. We have people um, from a gaming company, people from Vodafone, and so lots of different perspectives to help shape how the faculty and the syllabus and the, mm. the teaching um, happens. Um, 
I would also say that most cities have a wonderful community of meetups. So I run outside of Work Leads Digital. In Leeds, there's over 50 meetups that happen each month, which are absolutely free to attend. Mm -hmm. Everything from gaming to agile to testing to every, you know, Ruby to JavaScript to PHP to Code First Girls to Ladies of Code and to sort of wider techie sort of teddy events. And then 90% of them are free to attend. Mm -hmm be telling your students about this because mm -hmm. it's not what you know, it's who you know, and mm -hmm. they start to learn networking, they build their human skills, mm -hmm. uh, they build their knowledge of the ecosystem. Um, but equally, you know, people like Sally are wonderful in coming, coming to these meetups and, mm -hmm. and bringing people like me to her world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would definitely say look at kind of getting out into that space as well. Mm. So there's an abundance of, of opportunity out there mm -hmm. and, and opportunity for, for sort of cross-networking. I know, Hilary, you, you talked this morning about making sure when, when posting adverts, you post in the right place. You talked mm -hmm. about the criticality of that. Mm -hmm. Can you just expand on that? Yes, yeah, so, um, so we used to post in pretty traditional types uh, of places and then realised that, you know, that, w that was really curtailing... Um, reaching the audience that we were trying to reach to, to really increase in the diversity in all aspects of diversity for our um, postings. So we, we started by um, posting in all kinds of different um, race diversity type um, places. And there's a slide I had this morning that we can make available that had certain ones that we use um, in the United States. But then I realized we still weren't reaching women in IT and so found that there's an increasing number of particular um, places that we can post to reach women in IT, whether it, whether it is women in higher ed, women in IT. Um, that there's, there's a whole, I've got five or six, and we post all IT positions, all, to all of those sites. Um, so we don't sort of say, oh, well, we think we'll send this one here and this one here. We really, it, it's, a, a, it's an inclusive um, piece. Um, those just happen to be ones that I knew. Then I met with other CIOs, and it's one of the first questions that I will often ask them. Where do you post? Because if you can just find one more place um, from, a, from a colleague over here and another from over here, you're suddenly building a, 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 broader, a broader suite of, of uh, places to post uh, and using that all the time. And then we share that amongst all of the, um, the, the California. Um, it, it's not just the CSU. We actually reach out to UCLA and all of the, the UCs and the community colleges, and we've made diversity, equity, and inclusion, equity is what we tend to call it, but equality and inclusion, uh, a real um, mantra for, for change amongst the IT across the whole spectrum of California. Well, what, what tangible results have you seen? What does the data tell It's um, not, not clearly enough yet, and um, that was one of my big takeaways from, I think, this morning's gathering, is that we have to be even more... Um, intentional about being able to show data results for this to be able to get support from mm -hmm. HR or other places when when they're saying look that costs you money sometimes to post in some of these other places mm -hmm. and I'm saying that doesn't matter that's important that we do it but you're still going to get some some barriers from that so I think the data is important um, I, I don't have data that I can plot out I can just say that I, I I look around my team, I, I know the diversity of my own team to know that that has helped us move the, move the needle over the last years, both in, in, in race and gender diversity. Uh, I hope it's that. It may have been other things, and that's really the data that we really need to have on hand. Mm. And Jim, tell me about data. <laughs> <laughs> data. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think... Interesting what Hillary was saying. We do, we do do the normal things, but we also do use an agency, and we have a... My friend's over there. Um, uh, we, we can say things... You know, we can, if you're using an agency, you can be a bit more directive uh, about the type of person you're looking for. You know, you say, we're aiming to increase diversity. We're aiming to increase our gender. Please find candidates that fit these, you know, some of these criteria. And we're not, like I say, we're, we're quite relaxed about not having formal qualifications. We quite like people who, who, who are a bit quirky. That's the university. That kind of reflects the type of university I work in. 
And, and I think from that, A, it saved us an enormous amount of money. Conversely, you'd think, actually, we're paying an agency to do this, but we've saved so much money because my staff are not tied up. You know, screening you know, hundreds and hundreds of applications. Uh, we are much more directed in, in the type of roles we're looking for. Uh, it can occasionally be quite difficult, and I think it's been very successful. So in the last four years, we've increased our, our, we've increased our staffing overall, which is unusual for the sector. So we're about 153 staff now. And we, over the last four years, we've increased our gender by about 11% and our, and our diversity only by about 5%. That's the really difficult area is, is, is in, the, in the diversity area. My, my aim, my target is to try and reflect the university. So our student population is about 50-50 in terms of, in terms of uh, BAME and, and non-BAME. And in terms of students, it's 75%, no, actually 76% women and 24% men. We're never going to get there in terms, of, in terms of IT, but we should be moving a lot closer to it. I mean, I mean in general... Don't say never. Never, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, never, we never, we, you never know. But um, in terms of our staffing complement for the university, we, we employ more women than men. It's about 54, 55%. Mm. But in terms of our diversity, out of, out of all those thousands of staff we, we, we employ, we're at about 19%. So, so, again, not good, and that's an area that we are really focusing on and we're really trying to work on. And I think one of the things that I would look at is the word creativity. Yes. It's just, I'm probably a bit of a stickler for this, but I, I don't like the word STEM, because I think it's the wrong word. I think the right word is STEAM, because I think the, the yes. letter missing mm -hmm. is the A for arts. Mm. And I think, especially around diversity and females, I think if you focus much more on creativity and the purpose... Because we, we want more women in tech, we want more women in tech. If I saw that headline, I'd just be like, <laughs> you know, mm. why? But want to work on something that will change lives, want to work yeah. on something that will... Uh, giving a purpose and also focusing on the teamwork and the creativity. We're, we've got sort of decades of kind of things in the press, things in television and film, IT crowd, mm. of, uh, of what working in IT looks like. Mm. And I'd love, you know, big soaps like um, EastEnders to have better representation of people in technology in these things to, to actually show that it's actually much more people-centric, it's much more creative. You get to work on things that hundreds, thousands, millions of people will use and you can change the world with it. And I think that if you have more role models describing that, but also in your job descriptions, you're much more explicit of the fun and the creativity and the purpose that you can have, then that's not only you're going to attract hopefully more diversity, but potentially get you the winning candidate. Mm. Because if you know, you're, you're kind of advertising that mm. compared to a, another job description, which is, you know, mm. we want a software developer. Um, mm. you know, that's the sort of thing that you've got to go now, is you've got to go above and beyond. Salary isn't everything. Yeah, it's an interesting point, isn't it? I remember Alison Davis, who is the... Uh, I think she probably spoke at UCISA one year. She, she was the former CIO of the Francis Crick Institute. And uh, once when interviewed, she was asked what, um, you know, what, what she liked about IT. And her response was that IT is so pervasive, it's everywhere. You can literally choose an organisation to go and work in that suits the outfit that you want to wear, which I think is a, a beautiful way of explaining the, the point. It's pervasive. We can work in whatever uh, organisation suits us, but we haven't necessarily sold that mm -hmm. to the future generation of talent out there. Um, one thing that really struck me about you, Jim, was that you know your stats. You know your yes. stats around diversity, and of yeah. course diversity is all about ensuring that we've got the broadest pool of talent to pull mm -hmm. from. Um, how many people would know the stats for their organisation? Give me a show of hands. Mm -hmm. That's worryingly low, if you don't mm -hmm. mind me saying. How many of you are members or signed up to the Tech Talent Charter or something similar? Or well, something similar, yes. Or something. I can see probably a cluster of hands. Okay. What, what, what's your take on, on that in terms of the figures? It's... It's a really tricky one. I, I, know, I know my figures, um, and I kind of know the figures for Leeds, so it's Sky's Leeds office, um, and sort of wider in, in technology. Um, you, you have to understand the makeup of your team to understand where there is room for improvement, because mm -hmm. there is always, as we've talked mm -hmm. about, room for improvement. Um, 
and kind of owning it then gives you goals that you know you want to work to um, some normality um, in the diversity so you, th there is a good mix and that isn't mm. just on uh, on gender but on ethnicity on ages or you know backgrounds I think it's great that you know as an industry we, we don't need a degree anymore to go into technology and it's mm. you know that diversity of backgrounds is so important as well so if yeah. we if, if it's that simple if it's about creativity if it's about removing some of those those barriers of job descriptions and and um, and titles that we've put on it before what's stopping us from from changing it what's what's preventing us currently I'd, I'd say it's, it's a generational I would say that there's a generation it's a bit like the issues around academic pay you know the relationship between you know female male pay there's a whole generation there that's got to sort of cycle out <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think I think you'll suddenly find that pay differentials will suddenly equalize all of these but, but I think there is a generational thing going right. on here uh, and I think that's that, you know that, that's, that's sort of part of the industry you know a lot of us like some of us you know started when computers really got started you know uh, but, but you know and I think that that generation is beginning to come to an end and I think that's when you'll see that that generational cycle you know uh, and I think it's a generational thing, generally. But I think it's. I think the point that Hillary made is great of actually targeting different faculties. Mm. You know, I have a film degree. I, mm. You know, I am a technologist, and I, I you know, studied to code. I was of the ZX Spectrum and mm. Commodore 64 generation. Um, but, you know, I did a film degree, and actually quite a few people that did film degrees work in technology now. Yeah. A lot of the... The, the techniques for delivering a film uh, are very similar to agile. You know, you kind mm -hmm. of, you know, in television, you mm -hmm. shoot in sort of sprints on a soap opera. You've, you know, you've, you're very pragmatic if the weather turns. What can we move on to now? And we work as a team. Um, it's so it was hugely transferable to go into technology from a film and TV background. Um, and I think that look outside of your net mm. right now at universities you should be laughing you know mm. you've got all of the talent there yeah what on, what are you doing now to train people so right now if somebody's doing a geography degree and they want to gain skills in i don't know it project management or mm. if they want to try coding or they want some experience in public speaking or some of the mm. human skills that are actually really important to their careers mm. what are you doing as universities to do that and how are you harnessing the talent to say, actually, I've done a geography degree, but you know what? I've seen all of these adverts about working in technology. I'd like to do that. Mm. Um, how can I get that experience working at the university? Mm. And I think that uh, that's, I think, a, a mindset change which would open the floodgates. Because mm. mm. for me, kind of as an outsider, I wouldn't imagine you guys would have a huge amount of problem gaining t talent because mm. you, you're university, right? You've got amazing yeah. talent in your building. Mm. Right. No, we, we absolutely do, and, and you're right, we need to, we need to harness that. Um, we just launched um, a huge sort of from zero up to pretty, pretty large-scale sales force um, implementation in many areas of our campus, and hiring people with those skills, even if we can get them, they're probably more costly than we can afford. So we're working with faculty in the business school who are now teaching and um, facilitate, uh, they're, they're really facilitating using the Salesforce training modules, of which there are hundreds, thousands, and, and having their students go through that um, and then being able to pass those students over to us. We can then work with them as internships. The business school requires students to take an internship you know there's a there's a quid pro quo it's like a win-win-win for everyone when you can when you can get all the dots lined up um and so this is sort of the latest one here but it's just one example like you said we've just got students all over we need to be doing more mm. that's a fabulous example yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, I work at a university that, that thrives on, you know, disruption. That's what it does. And I think there's been some things that surprised me, you know, that, so we have this uh, thing called Modual, which is non-credit driven. So it's no, no credit, it's not, not for the thing. And it's just basically a professor put up saying, just going to get everyone together and you develop projects and work in a very safe space. Uh, and 500 students signed up. 
you know, uh, and then they decided to take go global with it. They're going to have the next one. The next one was in New York, and then one in Barcelona. And there's one. In, and uh, but those sorts of things kind of generate their own noise. But also very interesting what you mm. said about about learning those really key essential skills. I mean, we actually purchased some of the products that they produced. So you know, it's like a dating app for for skills. You know, I, I need someone. I need to score for a movie. You know, I need to score <laughs> my, my animation. Who's mm-hmm. who's writing music? You know, uh, swipe left, swipe right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, and there's an, another piece that we sort of sponsored called the Feminist Internet, you know, you know, you know, and that's come out of our, our institution and that's sort of developed its own legs to run on. And there was a really interesting project that I did get to, I was kind of interested on the periphery, but they produced a feminist Alexa and that was the project. The project aim was to produce a feminist Alexa and the whole thing was, was a reaction against these, 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 uni- these devices you have in your house and actually getting it to, to, to sort of talk back to you, know, to, to correct you, uh, to tell you when you're saying something wrong. And, and it was a really interesting because it, it involved you know, sociological, psychological, anthropological, mm-hmm. you know, design, coding, and, and it, they're not credit-bearing things. So this is what the students are really, you know, these create a lot of noise and a lot of generation, but then they're outside of their normal mode of study. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's fascinating that students mm-hmm. do this, and it's beginning to happen across universities. Uh, the Royal College of Music have got involved. You know, so so it's, that's a really fascinating aspect of where I think some of these cr- really creative things are going. And I think that's the case because no job now exists where you don't need technology skills. Mm. And I think that that's where I think academia will have to shake up because every qualification that you will need, sorry, any qualification, if you're a doctor, you will still need to have decent IT skills because of mm. how the, the NHS is obviously being digitised through to nearly every job now. You mm. need a decent amount of IT literacy and then potentially HTML and CSS. Potential, mm. And the more awareness you have on that, you know, the greater. But it, but it will be limiting your career if you don't have that. So I suppose as academia, how are you equipping your students for that world where they will need those skills. Um, it, it does speak more and more to the, the digital campus that we, that we saw Nick yes. speak about yesterday. Mm. I'm conscious we've got tons of people in the room that have got vast amounts of experience and I'm sure tons of questions. Can I, can I just throw it out to you guys? Any initiatives or innovations that you've seen in the space of talent and recruitment or any particular challenges that you're facing? I did threaten to descend on one or another. <laughs> I, I actually would like to have a challenge with recruitment, but I don't. Um, my biggest challenge is actually getting the right people on board from the staff that I've already got. So it's actually helping them change into this new way of working. So we're moving away from hands-on technology and much more into <coughs> consultancy, business analysis and all the rest of it. And largely those staff were recruited at a time when they really only had to communicate with their machines. Mm. And so that is really mm. particularly challenging for them. So it's, it's how we help bring them on board because you can't make every member of staff redundant. Mm-hmm. Any, any thoughts from the panel on that? Any response? Uh, I, I remember one instance where I actually there were, there were students and they had a problem and I brought them into the department to the desk of one of the infrastructure engineers and it's a, can you help the student? Yeah, they help the student. But then they came to see me as a group saying, please don't ever do that again. And I said, right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to do that again and again and again. But I also think, I think what we've tried to do in a funny sort of way is involve our staff who may be not working in those sort of rigidness is to try and get them more interested in the students, interested in what, what the students are doing. And we've just recently commissioned a huge project on render and storage. And that's actually you almost cross that bridge. So you've got people who are highly technical, who understand how networks work, etc. working with people who, is, who are saying, I want my animation to be done in 30 seconds <laughs> rather than 30 hours, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and understanding the, that needs. And I think that's helped enormously, pulling those teams who are quite reticent, you know, they've got this in the desk, they sit on, and they've got their potted plants, and, uh, and trying to get them out and get the, to talk to people. And I think that's really helped. We've had away days where we've had students, a student or two students sit at every table, uh, and then just saying, have a conversation. Uh, and it's been a difficult start. It starts kind of really slowly, but it does get going, you know, so, so I think it's getting that going. Yeah. Heidi. Got a microphone coming. 
So Heidi Fraser Crouch on the University of York. So we were recruiting recently for a, a head of software development. And the feedback we got from one of the candidates who, who wasn't actually successful, but that's made by the by, was that actually they were amazed at what went on in the university back office space. So they'd never thought, they thought a little bit like yourself thinking about universities as being full of academics and all mm. of these things going on. But without this realization that there was this complicated business that sat underneath it and mm. the idea that we might be working with cloud partners doing all these different developments, they'd spoken to people who were employed at the university, who'd come out of industry, who were just bowled over by what was going on. And the message we took from that was that we needed to tell people more what were we doing mm -hmm. and expose that an awful lot more you know it's not just boring spreadsheets and and whatever that's going on in the back office that there was some really interesting and innovative stuff so that was a real lesson for us because we know obviously what goes yeah. on but i think that people's views of universities outside are just so different they, they don't match with the sort of business yeah. versus the academic side. So we're, we're victims of our own modesty then, do not we? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I cannot agree more. And, you know, this is going to be like a horrible kind of brag, but I've hired people from the University of York. And they're very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Well uh, <laughs> who is? Who is? Because <laughs> actually the person I hired has now um, emigrated to Oregon to work for Nike. Uh, so he's, uh, he's gone up in the world. Um, so, yes, I, and I think that's a wider thing about role models and about sharing the stories. Everybody loves stories, right? Mm. And every one of us has mm. a story to tell. And you're lying to yourself if you don't have a story to tell. And I think mm. that a lot of it, you, you're absolutely right, is demystifying the academic sector because mm. you, you just will not attract talent without that. And I think that it goes back to that purpose and the excitement and the opportunity you get to change and, and actually the scale of the, the challenge at hand, which, which gets people excited. Um, and, you know, Sally does a wonderful job in Leeds of, you know, describing, you know, the work that her and her team do at Leeds Beckett. Um, but off the top of my head, I couldn't name many more. And, you know, I speak a lot at conferences um, and I don't see a lot of academia um, speaking at these conferences. And there's lots of calls for paper. There's lots of opportunities to share and shine a limelight, um, so, sorry, shine a spotlight on the great work that you're doing. Um, so I think another takeaway is if you head up a department, look at calls to papers, look at local meetups as a starting point. Um, and get somebody to speak at it. It's a great opportunity for their personal development, but it's a great way of attracting talent and also giving back to the community and sharing problems you've solved, sharing opportunities, um, and you know, inviting the private sector maybe to collaborate. I, I think there's a, another one to build on that in that we, it's one thing to get people in the door and we interview them, but in fact, they're interviewing us as well. Yes. And so we've, we've taken that on as a, as a challenge and said, okay, what, what can we be doing that really is telling our story in the few minutes that you get with someone when you're doing an interview? Um, we do um, what we call showcases. We do a faculty showcase where we bring faculty in and have them talk about how they're using technology um, in, and, in little snippets, and then we make a, a video of that and um, we could and a PDF type thing that you can have online as well. But we're doing for the first time next week a, um, a, a, our, our digital transformation we call eProcess Plus. And, and so we're doing an eProcess Plus showcase um, and bringing, that's in fact staff who are working with us in IT, but, but we're not, it's not the IT staff that are, we're putting up front and center. It's the colleagues that we're working with across the campus. And that's going to be an hour long with, with about 10 different faculty that we're, I mean, staff that we're showing off the work that they're doing in digital transformation. Um, and that will come out of that. What will come out of that will be a little short video that we'll be able to have on the website. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to have some little little clip, clips and and hopefully some some other even something that someone could take with them as they're coming to interview. I, I just think we're selling too to yeah. to these candidates, yeah. and and the competition is so tough. I think that's right. I remember talking to Laura Dawson, who many of you will know is uh, CIO at the London School of Economics, and she urged me to, to go for the CIO 100 list for exactly mm -hmm. that reason, mm -hmm. because people, when they're looking for employment, will go and seek out 
the stories of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you do get people coming to, to interview yeah. just for that reason, because they've, they've seen what you're doing and it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to market yourself. What do you do in the University of Arts to market yourself? IT, Jim. <laughs> in IT, that, I'm that, coming to that question at the back. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, I think that's a really difficult question. I think, I think when, when candidates come on board, we, we, we do tell them about the, you know, we're not going to hide the, 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 the type of organization we are. And I think it does attract, we do go out of our way to try and attract uh, you know, staff who reflect the values of the organization, who, who are very interested in creativity, very interested in enablement, very interested in diversity and equality. Mm. Uh, we're, we're very, very open uh, in those aspects. Uh, I think we do try hard to sell the, the, the very flexible work environment and being, being, in, being in London and being a very stable, stable environment. Um, you know, it, we, it, it's, it's always a difficult sell, you know, it, it's a very highly competitive market, uh, you know, Claire and I and, and other, other colleagues in London here, we seem to have a rotating uh, staff going around all our universities and slowly <laughs> edging up the, the, the greasy pole, uh, and, and we do sort of think, oh, all right, the imp Imperial has just stolen four of my staff, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, so it, it is quite, it is quite a frustrating cycle, but, but that's, that's how it happens, but but we find that the, the uh, staff will come work for us for very particular reasons. You know, they are at a particular stage in their career, a particular stage in their life, uh, and, and they and, and they don't want to freelance any longer. They want a period of time where they've got st stable in environment, and we can offer that. We can offer all these things. We can offer a very flexible environment, I and mean, also it's a, it's a very interesting uh, creative place to work. So it, it, it can be quite difficult, but but it does seem to work. For you. Um, okay, I was going to say, and I think. The, the problem you've got is nearly every private sector company will be able to go tick, 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 yes, I can do that. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 and yeah, I think yeah, they will. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think, the key to unlocking mm. talent is kind of going, what else can we do that yeah. they can't mm. do? Yeah. Mm. And I think in your personal institutions, mm. what can you offer which somebody else can't offer? Yeah. So whether it's access to people, mm. e e whether they're professors or visiting professors, mm. um, to autonomy, mm. giving them more autonomy that they would maybe not have in the private sector. Mm. Um, but it's, it's that differentiator because th when you're a candidate, and it is a candidate's market now, they can look at um, opportunities and they all pretty much stack up the same. So then, mm. unfortunately, then uh, what are the levers that they have to play with? One of them will unfortunately be salary, and that's where, you yeah, know, yeah. Mm -hmm. you'll probably so it gets lose tough. Yeah, so it exactly. Gets tough. However, we have some fantastic environments within which we work. Mm -hmm. You know, let's not under undersell that point. There's a question at the back. Hi, Lynn. Thank you, uh, Lynn Tucker Goldsmiths, another London university, stealing staff from other universities. <laughs> um, just, yes. She's just had one of mine, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, have you seen the advert um, for the NHS IT staff? Anybody seen that? I no. don't know whether it's just playing in London, but I, the, the NHS are advertising for IT staff on the TV. Um, and, you know, kind of showing how lovely it is to work in the NHS and what exciting creative mm -hmm. things you could do. Um, perhaps as Usizer or through Usizer, we could do something similar mm -hmm. um, if we're all struggling to recruit, you know, our candidates. So I was just thinking, is that something we could do collectively? That was Peter. more of a comment than a, well, so, oh, so a yeah. question. I'd love to hear Peter's take on this. <laughs> 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 that was, I don't see why not, everybody, yeah. just in yeah. case you missed yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, one of the whole reasons we're, we're here is to help, you know, support you in whatever challenges that there are. Mm -hmm. And if um, there is benefit in producing something that promotes the sector as an attractive place to work, promotes the mm. you know, use of IT in this sector, mm -hmm. then, yeah, it's something, it's something we can look at and see, see how we can do it. Mm. and perhaps learn from the NHS. I, I want to tell a story about somebody um, I've worked with. Uh, I have a particular challenge in that uh, the, the university I work for is based in the city of London. Uh, we, we compete against all of the big financial houses, the banks and, and so on in terms of uh, recruiting a lot of our staff. And I, I'd, I'd advertised for a solutions architect for over a year uh, and just couldn't get any applications because of the salary we were offering. And I had working with me at the time a developer who um, he was very quiet, but had done a PhD, sorry, not quiet, but had, quiet and had done a PhD in astrophysics. And I thought, well, if you can make sense of that up there, you can really make sense of my infrastructure. 
and she's now the best appointed solutions architect I've ever worked with, actually. But what that involves is investing an awful lot of money in development. Um, and I wondered if you've got any similar sorts of transferable from, you know, from the film industry. Yeah. What, what does it take to take somebody from a different environment and get them in? So none of us are born with these skills. Mm -hmm. And that's the truest thing. Everybody, every one of us in this room owes the, the, where we're sat to somebody believing in them. Sorry, I really need to sneeze. <laughs> but, um, I, and it is the truest thing. Somebody believed in me. I'm on my fourth career. I've done everything from film, music photography, local government, working with academia and businesses to encourage science and innovation, um, through to working in technology. And people who believed in me, believed in the skills that I had and went, you know, the hard skills are the easy bit to teach. You know, I had the delivery skills doing, uh, from in film and TV through to the stuff I did in local government. Um, teaching people about the software delivery life cycle, that stuff is easy. Mm. Teaching them human skills mm. is the hard bit. Mm. And finding somebody who's great at learning, has, you know, uh, great tenacity, that's, they're the really tricky candidates and they're the candidates with promise. Uh, right now, that's what I would always look at doing is, you know, your job description isn't going to do any work. You know, find great people mm. and give them great, you know, opportunities mm. to work. And I know that that's not easier, you know, to do, but... Um, but there's lots we can all do to do it. Yeah, but also, you, otherwise, t your colleagues will leave. If they constantly see you going to the external market because you're not giving them the opportunities because it's so expensive to train or because you need somebody to start quickly off the ground. Mm. Okay, cool, I understand that structure, I really do. Um, but you, great people will leave. Um, and I think my final point is also as a manager is see the opportunity in people that they don't see in themselves. Mm -hmm. I've, I've kind mm -hmm. of handpicked people and said, you know what, you'd be a great scrum master mm -hmm. and, you know, actually engineers. Mm -hmm. And they've gone, look, it's not really for me. And I was like, genuinely believe in me, trust, you know, mm -hmm. just go on the course. And they've absolutely flown as a, a mm -hmm. scrum master with a really, you know, highly technical background. And so I think as a manager, spot the opportunity in people that they don't see sometimes in themselves. Great point. Mm -hmm. and a couple of minutes left, just a couple of minutes. So a final point from each of you in terms of your top tip or, or best story on recruitment and talent. Go ahead. <laughs> Goodness, I, I, th I think yeah, we're all, you know, it's a leadership conference, we're leaders. It's up to us to change the, change the landscape. Uh, and and it, within your own institutions, you are powerful people. You know, as Nick Peckford said the other day, everything's turning towards digital and infrastructure and combinate. You can begin to dictate your terms, in effect. You, know, you can say, actually, I need more help doing this. I need, I need better market supplements for my staff. I need, like we've done, we have a, our training budget is larger than the HR's training budget. You know? so, so you're in a great position to begin to, to say to universities, Actually, if you want these things to happen, if you want these things to succeed, this one, whole wonderful world that Nick Petford painted, then you're going to have to invest, and, and you need to win that argument. And I think if you win that argument, you will pull the other stuff will come along. But, but we're the leaders. That's our responsibility. We're also responsible, as you said, for the care of our, of our staff and making sure our staff you know, work in a, in, a, in, a, in a great environment that's diverse, that's very fair, that's very even. And, and, and promotes them and allows all that to happen. So I think, I think there's lots of really important things to do. It's not just about IT, I always say that. <laughs> and, I w and I would just end by saying, don't ever feel that you're doing this alone. Um, we are probably almost all of us, both um, here in this room, here in this country, in the United States, around the globe in IT, we are all dealing with some of this and how can we make sure let's learn from each other let's not so d don't ever feel insular about how it, it can be pretty it can be pretty tough to go home and you know it's it's another month that i haven't hired my solutions um engineer or or, or whatever that is and and yet that you know you can get the other side of it and and i would encourage looking at other diversity, equity, inclusion um, materials that are out there and really, uh, and really learning from each other, as I did with the example of where do you post. You don't have to find them all. There's a lot already out there. Take that, add to it, and share it back out. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, so I think, picking up on that, 
give, for, give people the opportunity to step up to roles. If you have a role empty right now, saying to somebody, do you know, do you want to have a, just some experience in that role? Mm. It might be that they're not ready for that role, mm. and that's cool, but you're giving them some experience um, so that when they are ready, or in your example, they are ready and they just needed somebody to give them that opportunity. And secondly, please share your stories. Share what you're doing in your faculties outside in the communities, in the tech and digital communities. Mm. You know, I dare you all to go back and find somebody to speak. And if you can't find someone to speak, then look at public speaking training, giving people the confidence to do yeah. that. Um, because it's, we've had huge amounts of successes at Sky hiring from those groups where we sponsor the groups and we put on some speakers. Um, that we get much more out of that than big billboards because mm. it's the connection people want. They want to go, right, that sounds like a great place to work. You look like a great person to work with. You know, let's talk. Mm. Um, so I challenge you all, in all of your cities, I promise you there will be a meetup mm. that will gladly, because um, they're always looking for speakers, um, want you to, you know, to share your stories. And then you're also giving back as well, and people will also be able to potentially help you with some of the problems you face. I love that, and I think on the, on the I dare you all note, I would uh, <laughs> I would ask you all to, to give a very warm round of appreciation for for the panel. Thank you. <laughs> one one final plug, of course, you Siza does have a women in IT group. Um, do you want to talk a bit more about that, Jim? Because uh, I know I, you're I'm in. On the group, I, uh, I know Li uh, Lynn is. Where's Lynn? Yeah, Lynn. Lynn. Ma maybe people who are on the group could you know, maybe maybe stand up, make yourself known. If anyone's interested in in joining the group, uh, you know, uh, we are beginning to to build a head of steam and start to do some interesting things. So I think it, it is something new for you, Sizer, and I think we've got a fantastic chair with Lynn. So, so um, you know, please seek us out to talk to us about that group as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Yep. Um, Thank you. I believe we have the annual general meeting now.